Okay. Good afternoon from Budapest and good morning or good evening, depending upon where you're joining us from. I'm Ben Wittorsch Holbrook Fellow in the Shattuck Center on Conflict Negotiation and Recovery at Central European University's School of Public Policy. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth Lemkin reunion and the first to be held online. This is the first of five sessions that will take place through July 3rd with subsequent panels at 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. Central European time tomorrow and Friday. Each year, the Shattuck Center hosts the Lemkin Reunion, a gathering established in 2014 with the generous support of an, anon of an anonymous donor. The reunion is named to honor Rafael Lemkin, the Polish lawyer who, having lost most of his family in the Holocaust, coined the term genocide and then campaigned tirelessly throughout his life to have it codified as an international crime. The title of this year's event is Values in Retreat, is the resurgence of transactional foreign policy hindering the prevention of mass atrocities, the promotion of the rule of law, and the global response to COVID-19? Why are we asking such a broad, multifaceted question? Because achieving consensus, consensus on urgent global challenges seems more elusive now than at any time in half a century. The state of global affairs is all the more alarming just over 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall an event that many thought would usher in an era uh, of unparalleled international cooperation and the irreversible proliferation of democratic ideals. Achieving multilateral consensus has never been easy and diplomacy itself has always included a heavy transactional component. Today's status quo, however, increasingly resembles a zero sum game in which players try to wring maximum individual benefit out of each relationship often to the detriment of the shared values and established norms that ended the Cold War and saw the number of democracies worldwide increase exponentially. Unlike past Lemkin reunions that focused on specific acts and instances of genocide, this year we will scrutinize the system in which mass atrocities persist and sadly thrive more than 70 years after the world said never again to the Holocaust. We asked, does transactional foreign policy bear at least some responsibility? And is it plausible that governments commit mass atrocities in part because the rest of the world lets them get away with it? Though many nations are quick to condemn mass crimes, few are willing to risk their own soldiers to stop them. But have we, we become so unwilling to risk economic consequences, threaten a trade relationship or jeopardize a strategic partnership to stand on principle and stop a government from murdering or abusing its own citizens. Rather than working to stop them, some of the world's most influential states help perpetuate atrocities by assisting, shielding, or aligning themselves with the perpetrators in pursuit of broader strategic objectives. We will also ex explore rule of law, the rule of law and the immediate challenge of COVID-19 because the circumstances that have prevented decisive collective action against atrocities also impact these challenges. Anywhere the rule of law breaks down and democracy declines, human rights are threatened. And when a government that doesn't uphold its citizens' rights loses legitimacy in their eyes, one must ask, to what lengths will it go to preserve its power? It may not lead to atrocities, but the country can become less stable and potentially a threat to global, st to global stability. And turning to the global pandemic, is it really far-fetched to expect, uh, to expect countries that support, facilitate, or take part in mass crimes would think twice about utilizing the crisis to their singular advantage rather than cooperating globally to solve it? Over the next three days, a diverse group will discuss these questions and more. Please join us for each session to help perpetuate the discussion here and in the public square. Please submit your questions using the link and instructions below. I would like to thank all of our speakers who graciously agreed to participate. Thank you to the Shattuck Center team and center director, Kirsten roberts Lyre, who all contributed significantly to make this event reality. And a huge thanks to Daniel Zimanyi, our IT specialist and director of these broadcasts. Now it's my honor to introduce our panel chair, Diane Stone, Dean of CEU's School of Public Policy, whom we also heartily thank for her support, her and the school's tremendous support. Diane? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and greetings again from Budapest. Uh, 
I'm Diane Stone. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Policy. As some of you may know, our school is in the process of moving to a new country in just four weeks time. We reopen in Vienna where the school will welcome a new cohort of students. But today it's my great pleasure to help uh, open the Lemkin reunion and to chair this first session on transactional foreign policy and the international system, which is the last event for SPP in Budapest. So this is a scene setting session uh, where we will discuss some of the forces behind the move to transactional foreign policy, as well as some of the consequences. So what is it, this thing, transactional uh, diplomacy and transactional foreign policy? Daniel Dresner from Tufts University has described United States transactional diplomacy as, be as being, and I quote, practiced on the base of, I don't care about human rights abuses. I don't want to muddy things up by insisting on American values. I just want the deal that I want. That's the quote. Now, is this approach here to stay and become entrenched in bipolar international negotiations, further undermining multilateral efforts? Or is it linked to a particular style of political leadership where an individual leader indulges in this type of self-interested quid pro quo foreign policy for the term of their office? Or more worryingly, is this type of foreign policy symptomatic of a deterioration of democratic norms and traditions, and in the case of the United States, a symptom of the end of the American century? We shall see. And we have some illustrious speakers to speak to these themes. And to everyone who has zoomed in, as Ben has said, we also welcome your questions on chat. Our first speaker is the Rector of Central European University, Michael Ignatiev, who's well known already for his writing on international relations and nation building. Our second speaker is John Shattuck from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and who is also a senior fellow at the Kennedy School. John gives his name to the center and he was a, previ uh, a previous rector of the university. Our third speaker is Ned Temko, who we welcome to the university. Ned is international affairs columnist for the Christian Science Mon Monitor. And again, I would just like to reinforce what Ben has said about um, the Lemkin reunion team uh, with himself, also Hakam Al-Shah, also a Holbrook fellow. They have been the brains behind the event and guiding the process is Kirsten roberts Lyer as director of the center. And all of them have been sent, uh, supported by um, the researchers in the center, Karen Culver and Adnan Saman. Now, originally they had planned this uh, event to be in Budapest and in person. And of course it was then reorganized to be delivered online. Now, this is something that we're all becoming used to but going online also affects the praxis of diplomacy. Even before the pandemic arrived, there was much talk of, or at least hope in, uh, the idea of digital diplomacy or cyber diplomacy. Now we are all online. Now this kind of diplomacy is said to be more open and inclusive to transnational actors and non-state groups. Perhaps uh, digital diplomacy is one dynamic mediating in some small way, the self-interested nature of transactional uh, diplomacy, maybe. But let me now turn to the rector, Michael Ignatiev. Michael is our first speaker who will speak on uh, the theme of responsibility to protect. Michael, over to you. Uh, there we go. Um, doesn't matter how long you've done Zoom, you can still forget to unmute, and I apologize to all concerned. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Uh, the Lemkin reunion has become part of the corpus of what CU does, and it's very nice to share this um, 
panel with uh, such distinguished people, including my distinguished predecessor. Um, I want to talk a little bit about responsibility to protect, which is a doctrine um, uh, with which I had an association. Um, it was a doctrine about um, the responsibility of states to prevent mass atrocities in other countries. Um, it was a doctrine about um, that reconceived sovereignty in, and moved it away from the idea of inviolability, uh, non, non intervention, uh, exclusive jurisdiction, to an idea that sovereigns, states, are responsible for their own citizens. And they also had responsibility for citizens uh, in danger in other countries. It was not an intervener's charter, but it was a way to, of reconceiving sovereignty at the end of the Cold War. It formed part of an international report. Um, it became and still is UN doctrine. Um, and its fate, its genesis and its fate, I think is a way that shines some light on what's happened to our world since 1989. It has its genesis, obviously, with Lemkin. That's why it's appropriate to talk about it in a Lemkin seminar, because we wouldn't have um, an idea that human beings have an obligation to um, prevent genocide had it not been for this extraordinary Polish refugee who camped out in the UN headquarters in the 1940s and simply lived in the place until the world responded to his call for a genocide convention. Um, and for any student watching, he's the great living example of what a single courageous individual can do to change international law. If you then move forward to the post 89 world, um, what became apparent is that um, the world that Lemkin wanted, which was a world that would prevent genocide, would have states actively involved in the prevention of genocide, was really impossible in the period of Cold War antagonism, since any intervention by a um, big power threatened to trigger uh, a nuclear exchange. And therefore, the very idea of intervening to prevent mass atrocities was a difficult proposition in the Cold War. After the Cold War, with the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the emergence of the United States as a superpower, um, still in a period when China is not the dominant uh, is not the dominant power it is today, a window opened, a brief window opened, in which it was possible to conceive of, reconceive of sovereignty as responsibility, and to begin begin begin, begin to conceive of a doctrine in which states might intervene in cases where there were mass atrocity killings in other places. The end of the Cold War was not only the end of the Soviet empire, it was, the emer it was also the period of the emergence of um, an explosion of democratic uh, self-determination in um, the Balkans and in the uh, area of the former Soviet empire. And in that explosion of national self-determination, um, genocide reemerged. Um, John Shattuck was uh, an important part of the American response to genocide in Bosnia, and so he will know about this. Um, when states um, chose to be self-determining, they wanted to create ethnically hom homogeneous units and expel or exterminate or kill those who are not part of the national this is particularly the case in the Balkans, and it created an enormous problem, a moral problem, a geostrategic problem. Um, and out of this turmoil in the Balkans in the 90s, the idea of responsibility to protect uh, took root. The idea that in conscience shocking situations where human beings were faced with mass ethnic cleansing or genocidal killing, it was the responsibility of states to step in and try and stop it with negotiation, with mediation, with everything, but as a last resort with the use of force. Some of this was a reflection on the failure of the UN system to stop mass killing in, in um, Kosovo and in Bosnia. Uh, some of it uh, then legitimized 
the, the attempts of the United States to lead coalitions to stop this killing. Um, I think one of the things to say, however, um, getting back to our main theme, is that the very idea of uh, responsibility to protect was essentially conditional on American power and on the capacity of American military power to back intervention. Um, European states did not have the capacity to run military interventions on their own, even in their own backyard in, in the Balkans. It was really an American moment. Uh, Dayton was made possible by Richard Holbrook and that team of which John was a part. Um, and so the idea of responsibility to protect was always dependent on the capacity of the United States. It's not only its military capacity, but this would be a point I would make, its democratic capacity. That is the willingness of uh, the American Congress, the American people to put their soldiers in harm's way for the sake of humanitarian goals that were not often uh, very visibly a national security interest. Um, so R2P emerges in a moment, a brief moment of American hegemony um, that coincides with a period when um, the um, uh, Russia is in decay, China is not yet ascending. I think then what happened, and I'll try and come to a conclusion quickly, um, is that uh, intervention by the United States um, went catastrophically wrong. R2P was never used as a justification for the operation in Iraq, but there's no question that the Iraqi intervention by the United States to overthrow the Saddam Hussein regime tarnished the very idea of military intervention. But more crucially, it simply eliminated in American public opinion, further willingness to send troops into harm's way uh, for the sake of promoting democracy, human rights, whatever. Um, the uh, parallel experience of the difficulty in Afghanistan um, also reinforced that doubt. That would be a key point I'd make is that transactional American politics has emerged in part also because of democratic exhaustion, skepticism, the part of the American public about a values-based foreign policy, because a values-based foreign policy seems to ultimately mean you have to put uh, your men and women in harm's way for goals that don't seem to be clear to the American people. So I put a lot of emphasis on the erosion of, of, of democratic legitimacy. This problem is then compounded by the Libyan intervention in 2010 and 11, a reluctant United States backed the French and the British in Libya and the sequelae, the consequences of Libyan inter inter intervention have only compounded skepticism towards the very idea of intervening to protect civilians from um, harm. And then we've lived with the consequences which are the, um, the Syrian situation where um, uh, a resurgent um, uh, Russia has basically said, if you come after our client, Mr. Assad in Syria, you will be coming after us. And at that point, the very possibility of humanitarian intervention or the creation of corridors, or the creation of safe zones for Syria simply evaporated. So an idea to conclude that emerged in a brief moment of American unipolar polar dominance, and that was sustained by a fragile democratic coalition in the United States in favor of humanitarian rescue of populations in danger, um, then uh, encountered the very, very difficult reality of getting interventions right, the catastrophic failure of the intervention in, in Iraq, and then uh, the failures in Libya. So that's, I think, where we are. And we need to put the story of disillusion with intervention, disillusion with getting involved in other people's real estate and other people's human rights as part of the story of why uh, American foreign policy and European foreign policy and everybody's foreign policy 
has become steadily more transactional and steadily less value driven. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for your words there. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce John Shattuck um, and he will speak uh, on reflections on transatlantic, transatlantic democracy since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Diane, and thank you for your leadership. And uh, I want to pay a particular tribute to my successor, Michael Ignatieff, who's just very ably outlined the responsibility to protect. But uh, I want to thank him for his heroic defense of academic freedom in the heart of Europe uh, in these recent years. Um, I think CEU has really been a shining example of what academic freedom, indeed, what human rights and democracy really are all about. So thank you, Michael. Um, let me uh, give you a few personal reflections about uh, the last period in our history from the fall of the Berlin Wall today and try to do it all in 15 minutes or less. Um, you know, let me start by saying I was in Prague in 1988 um, and I met secretly with a uh, dissident who was a colleague of the jailed dissident Václav Havel at the time. It was a very Stalinist, uh, difficult situation uh, in Czechoslovakia and uh, we had our meeting and uh, I was, I departed and gave a report on Havel's condition. That's really the beginning of this story, but it, I will fast forward very quickly to um, the fact that uh, two years later, Václav Havel, then the president of Czechoslovakia after the Velvet Revolution, named my secret contact as his first ambassador to the United States of democratic Czechoslovakia. It was a dramatic moment. It was a very, to me, particularly an illustrative moment of the, of the possibilities and indeed at that stage realities of what was happening in the world with respect to democracy. Um, we of course saw a whole endless series, a head spinning series of mostly peaceful democratic revolutions that took place throughout Eastern Europe, and then far beyond uh, South Africa, of course, uh, and uh, Latin America and parts of Asia. And only in China did the democracy movement get stopped uh, in 1989. Um, and of course, Francis Fukuyama famously in his uh, now I'm afraid somewhat infamous article, The End of History, uh, characterized uh, what was happening as a kind of euphoric uh, opportunity for an endless series of uh, democratic revolutions. Um, it was actually at the time quite a plausible theory. So I don't put it down and I know Fukuyama well and I think he was uh, speaking rather uh, candidly about that moment. Um, after all, the only game in town after 1989 remained uh, democracy. Uh, there was, it was a unipolar world. Uh, there was an ideological unipolarity, not just geopolitical. Um, but when the, when the Berlin Wall fell, there were really two great forces that were unleashed. And I think we need to understand both of them. And only one of them, the forces of integration, uh, really explains the democratic revolutions that I've just briefly outlined. We should look at those forces quickly to see how powerful they were at the time. The erasing of ideological borders, the demand for political participation across the globe and for new leadership, the rise of global markets and transnational capitalism, the expansion and development of regional organizations, of course, like the European Union or NATO or the World Trade Organization, all devoted to promoting democracy, markets, and security the revolution in communications, uh, and indeed, above all, the invention of the internet as the ultimate example, if you will, of the end of history. Um, these changes seem to demonstrate that the movement to democracy was indeed unstoppable. Now, here comes the personal reflection a little bit. I was skeptical. 
Uh, I was skeptical because I was a civil rights lawyer and I'd been engaged for a long time in struggles for democracy and human rights in the United States. And I knew how, based on my work in the civil rights movement, uh, the 1960s, how hard it was to build democracy and respect for human rights. This isn't something that you can simply do by making a regime change. Uh, you can't grow these institutions like an independent courts and critical media and active civil society overnight. Uh, and indeed at the, in the US uh, back then in a period that seemed to be flourishing from a human rights standpoint, there were constant setbacks and struggles I was involved in fighting the abuses of the Nixon administration, uh, civil rights and civil liberties abuses. Um, these were of course stopped by the courts and by the media and by civil society and by civil society actors like the American Civil Lib Liberties Union in which I was involved at the time. But even after Nixon was uh, impeached by the House Judiciary Committee and resigned from office, the post-Watergate reforms that seemed to augur well for civil rights and civil liberties in the United States uh, were halted by a reactionary rollback uh, that began very soon afterwards, and the struggle had to start all over again. And then when I went into the U.S. government, uh, as Michael has kindly noted, uh, as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, my skepticism about the unstoppability of the forces of integration and democracy uh, deepened. Um, there I saw the collapse of Yugoslavia. I saw uh, the genocide in Rwanda, mass atrocities, ethnic cleansing, genocide, uh, the, the very kinds of issues that grabbed the attention and had such an impact on Raphael Lemkin. Uh, earlier, uh, I made a mission to Srebrenica where uh, 8,000 Muslim men had been slaughtered in the largest single uh, episode of genocide in Europe since the Holocaust. Um, it was very different from my mission to Czechoslovakia, where I met with someone who later became, of course, the ambassador to the United States. Um, what, what I saw was the other set of forces that had been unleashed by the fall of the Berlin Wall, and these were the forces of disintegration. And they were very powerful. And indeed, um, not only in Bosnia and Rwanda, but of course later in 9-11 and in Iraq, uh, I saw how easily these forces could overwhelm the forces of integration and stop the democracy movement in its tracks. Meanwhile, uh, early in the 2000s, a backlash was building against one of the major forces of integration, globalization, the development of global markets and the fall of, of borders. Um, the backlash was really, was caused by great anger, public anger at elites and the global economic system that was producing these elites. People throughout the rust belts of Europe uh, where much manufacturing had gone on in the past and who were now feeling that they were being left behind by globalization as many of their jobs migrated to lower wage countries overseas. Uh, they were deeply concerned and uh, they feared uh, what globalization was doing to them. Um, national loyalties and tribal instincts and the fear of outsiders all began to reemerge as driving forces of politics in Europe and the United States. Um, and they drove the anti-global politics, which were very skillfully manipulated by what I would call uh, populist entrepreneurs, uh, people like uh, Slobodan Milosevic in, uh, in Serbia, uh, Berlusconi in Italy, who manipulated the communist fears of Italians, uh, Brexit, the Brexiteers who manipulated the British fear of Europe, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, in France, who uh, manipulated the French fear of the Germans as well as the European Union. Viktor Orban, above all, in Hungary, who manipulated the fear of outside domination uh, of Hungarians. And of course, uh, finally, and above all, and as the sort of apotheosis of, of what I'm talking about, Donald Trump, 
uh, in the United States who manipulated white Americans' fear of increasing racial diversity in the United States. And I think all of these fears fed into a new spirit of exclusionary populism and a new form of right-wing nationalism. And this was in many ways the inevitable, or if not inevitable, certainly uh, likely outcome of the forces of disintegration that I've witnessed earlier in Yugoslavia and Rwanda and elsewhere. And Orban and Trump were the primary and remain the primary proponents of this right-wing nationalism, uh, which is uh, in a sense, an example of the destruction of democracy. Its major features are attacks on democratic institutions like independent courts and free press and civil society. Uh, it's anti-government attacks on uh, what Donald Trump has called the deep state and norms of democratic governance, uh, polarization, uh, attacks on political opponents who are labeled as enemies of the people so that there's very little ground for uh, compromise within a democratic setting. So this is the status quo today. Um, it's a far cry from the euphoric world of 1989. Um, but I think just as that world wasn't the end of history, neither is this one. And uh, today's right-wing nationalism, I think, uh, is not necessarily the last word of where we're going. Let me conclude on an optimistic note by telling you why I believe, very specifically, in the United States on July 1, 2020, that I think right-wing nationalism is wearing out its welcome in the US, and I think also in Europe and why a democratic renewal, at least uh, in an election context, may be right around the corner. There are three factors for this. Uh, we know them all very well, and they're all quite new. Uh, they're dangerous, some of them, and optimistic, others. The two dangerous ones are, first of all, the COVID pandemic, of course, and the total failure of uh, Trump-style governance to manage uh, this situation in the United States, creating chaos and confusion, alienating the rest of the world, and turning the United States uh, even more into a sort of pariah state, as we can see symbolized by the EU travel ban on American citizens that is going into effect on Monday. So, that's the COVID pandemic, and it certainly has laid bare the failure of right-wing leadership, uh, nationalist leadership like Trump's. The second is the economic crisis, of course, which has resulted in some respects from the economic shutdown, uh, but has also produced a massive worldwide depression, which will require and re does require major governmental responses and international coordination that right-wing nationalists like Trump and Orban oppose and are incapable of producing. And then the third rather remarkable and very new and very exciting uh, development is the growing social unrest and mobilization of mass protests in response to systemic racism and economic inequality. And I think these responses that we've seen around the world, but particularly strongly in the United States, even in the midst of the pandemic, are early manifestations of democracy acting through civil society. So I think the big question, as I, and I will conclude with this question, is whether these factors will converge in November uh, to produce a major change, particularly in the US. My hope, is that the great 19th century European observer of American democracy, Alexis de Tocqueville, got it right when he predicted, and I quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than other nations, but in her ability to repair her faults. We'll see, but I'm hopeful. Thank you, Diane.
Thank you very much, John. It's great to see a positive future coming our way. And, and the, uh, also to hear that, uh, um, you know, global problems like uh, disease and pandemic do not respect national borders and can force cooperation in times when we need it. Mm. Okay, um, let me just also say at this point that Ben has informed me that we have 45 plus people uh, watching on YouTube. So, uh, and some questions already coming in, uh, which is great to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we will uh, turn to our guest speaker, Ned Temko, and uh, his talk is entitled The New World Disorder, more of the same and how it happened, and again, a positive note, how it can be repaired. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, good afternoon. I'm not only pleased to be with you today, I'm honored to share a platform, albeit a Zoom platform, with two men whose work I've followed and admired for such a long time, Michael Ignatiev and John Shattuck. I'd also like to thank Benjamin Wittorsch, who has been key to organizing this sixth Lemkin reunion, and who first got in touch with me some months ago to ask me to speak at your opening session. Ben approached me because he'd seen the introductory piece I'd contributed to a twice monthly series of articles in the newspaper for which I'm an international affairs columnist, and for which in an earlier incarnation, I was a longtime foreign correspondent the Christian Science Monitor in Boston. He was struck by how the theme of our series, which is called Navigating Uncertainty, so chimed with the theme of this conference. The focus of the conference, of course, is what's been called transactional diplomacy, a turning away from international cooperation and alliances in favor of a kind of what's in it for me series of bilateral deals based on each individual state's power and their narrow national interests. The Monitor series is broader, but that is very much a part of it. The series had a long gestation period, beginning last year with conversations among our top editors and correspondents around the globe. We'd all been struck by a sense of a world unmoored from international institutions and alliances to be sure, but also from a range of other widely held assumptions that had been key to international stability and progress, even in times of real crisis, ever since the end of the Second World War. And all of this was before nearly every governing structure on earth would find itself hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the assumptions under strain, even before COVID-19, weren't explicitly political or diplomatic. Some were economic. The notion, for instance, that if you worked hard, played by the rules, free market economies and free trade would make you more successful than your parents' generation. Or another critically important assumption about the way we communicate with one another and make choices about everything from our own lives to the leaders and governments we choose to follow. It's the very notion of facts a shared sense of what's actually happening in the world around us. And that's critical if we're to engage respectfully with those whose opinions we may not share and make decisions based on considered judgment rather than propaganda or ideologically driven conspiracy theories. Still, the theme of your conference, the unmooring of international politics and diplomacy from their post-World War II norms is central to much of the uncertainty and instability in today's world. And if we're to understand this new world disorder, it's important to understand how the old world order came to be, why it survived and thrived for so long, and how it's now come to be in such peril. To an extraordinary degree, it was the product of a single nation in a single moment of history the United States in the aftermath of the horrific devastation of the Second World War. There's a book, by the way, called The Wise Men about the half dozen or so remarkable, if at times eccentric, American diplomats who were at the heart of this story. It's by Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas. And if you can lay your hands on a copy, which is not so easy these days, it is a terrific read. 
there was nothing preordained in what would become known as the American century. As one of these so-called wise men, Averill Harriman, observed at the time, with US troops coming back at the end of the World War, by far most Americans were in a mood to turn inward, or in his words, just go to the movies and drink Coke. But the US instead turned outward, and largely as a result, in the years following the war, a whole mesh of new international institutions took root. The United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the precursor body of the European Union, a range of human rights treaties and organizations, and of course, the NATO military alliance. Perhaps most remarkable was the Marshall Plan, which with American dollars helped rebuild the shattered economies of Western Europe. Yes, American business and American influence ultimately benefited as well. And there was a geopolitical calculation involved. It was a deliberate economic and security counterpoint to the Soviet Union. It was part of the policy of containment of Soviet influence during the Cold War. Still, taken as a whole, these post-war institutions, and crucially, the underlying principle of American involvement in, often leadership of, international coalitions and alliances of free nations with free economies and free citizens, all of that, even at the height of the Cold War, underpinned a remarkably stable set of international rules of the road that were understood and broadly followed. The system wasn't perfect. American power wasn't always exercised wisely, at times even justly, but it did ensure decades of peace on a European continent that had just fought two world wars within the space of 20 years. And both in Europe and in other parts of the world, it undoubtedly added to the sum total of prosperity, security, health, education, basic human rights. So why now does it seem in such retreat or disarray? There was a series of factors, starting with a major redrawing of the geopolitical map of Europe as governments across the Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe collapsed under popular upheavals in the late 1980s, and then the Soviet Union itself ceased to exist. And in the years since, we've seen the rise of a truly globalized economy, a technological revolution that redefined both the world economy and domestic economies. And the eclipse of post-Soviet Russia as a world power by an increasingly assertive and especially economically and increasingly powerful China. Yet one event in particular, one jolt to the international system may best illuminate how we got from the old world order to our new world disorder. And that's the 2008 financial crash. In many ways, the crash marked a turning point. Globalization had until then been inexorably deepening. It was a phenomenon which alongside its handmaiden, the technology revolution, was not only widely accepted by key leaders and opinion formers, it was being celebrated, even rhapsodized. And in some senses, that wasn't crazy. If you'd drawn up a ledger of costs and benefits from the, these twin revolutions, the plus side was undeniably impressive. The new wealth and opportunities created, the new ideas and new businesses, new links among businesses, institutions, governments, among individual people all around the globe. Not to mention in the United States and other developed economies, a huge price benefit for consumers. But there were costs too. Most of all, the jobs that were lost in traditional industries and a pervasive inequality. Those who did well out of globalization and technology did really well. Some had become multimillionaires, even billionaires. The banks thrived. But other people, even those who hadn't necessarily lost their jobs, did less well. And crucially, in the wake of the 2008 crash, the people at the top were fine. The banks, with few exceptions, emerged without serious damage. This despite the fact that they were the proximate cause of the disaster. A whole lot of things, some directly, some indirectly, flowed from what happened in 2008 and from its aftermath. 
The most important politically was that it highlighted and deepened a sense of real anger among those who felt that globalization was passing them by. And worse, that the winners, the businesses, their own governments, the so-called elites, were either blind to this or just didn't care. These were feelings, by the way, that were supercharged and amplified by one aspect of the tech revolution, the internet and social media. The result was fertile ground for a new breed of populist politics that played on this resentment, this raw anger. And it wasn't just populist politics. It was often authoritarian, nationalistic, anti-immigration, anti-globalization. These new breed politicians were interested in the rules and institutions of the post-World War II world only in as much as they could see a direct benefit to their own countries, indeed to their own domestic political fortunes. In other words, we had what's in it for me, transactional diplomacy. That was one explanation, not the whole story, but one explanation for the referendum victory that took Britain out of decades long membership in the European Union. And it is also part, a bigger part, of another and more consequential change, the 2016 election victory of President Donald Trump in the United States. I emphasize the case of President Trump not to reduce to him alone or to American politics alone, the enormously complex changes that we're living through. But America does matter a lot. And I want to take a few moments to make the case for why that's so, and also for why the broader international shift towards this transactional diplomacy should matter to us so deeply. In part, the outsized importance of American politics is because the US was key in creating the institutions and norms of the post-World War II order. And it's also been key in the more recent twin revolutions of globalization and technology. But it's more than just a question of direct US political or economic action. At least as important to America's role in the world has been what's sometimes called soft power. The importance of America as an idea, or perhaps more accurately, an ideal or a set of ideals opportunity in economic terms, but also basic freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, protest, freedom of movement, and freedom from arbitrary or authoritarian constraint. All of this underpinned by the fundamental rule of law. Now, I know this sounds hopelessly naive to our contemporary ears, or even like a page borrowed from some dictionary of American political jingoism. But I experienced firsthand the effect of these ideals and of America's identification with them during my years as a foreign correspondent. The effect not just on governments, whether friend or foe, but on the people these governments ruled. In Cold War Moscow, ordinary Russians, not just dissidents. In the black townships of apartheid South Africa, even among critics or foes of US government policy on both sides of the Middle East conflict, and perhaps most dramatically in Berlin, where in one of the most vivid memories I have from my years of reporting, I had the good fortune to be on the East German side of the wall on that night nearly 31 years ago when it came down. Now it's true that the actions and policies of the United States, like those of any country, have not always perfectly lived up to these ideals. In some ways, they still don't. But the US did project and come to embody the notion that these values mattered, that they were worth aspiring to, holding up as a standard, defending. It's striking that even over the past year, demonstrators in the streets of Hong Kong, for instance, sometimes carried aloft along with their protest placards, the flag of the United States of America. What's changed is that as part of America's shift towards a more transactional, a more me first diplomacy, there's been a retreat from this soft power role as well. Beyond the direct effect of making US interventions, whether private or public with other governments less likely, there's an implicit one that may have even greater implications for human rights. 
it will leave the authoritarian governments feeling less restrained in taking aim at guarantors of political freedom, like an independent judiciary, in moving to silence critical voices and independent journalism, in cracking down on their opponents. Indeed, there's already been evidence of this, whether in places like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Hong Kong, or in the so-called illiberal democracies of Eastern Europe. Yet I'd like in closing to return to our Christian Science Monitor series. And despite all that I've said, strike a slightly less discouraging note about where we are and where we may be headed. The Monitor series, and I urge you to try to read all of it if you can, it's on the Monitor website, has provided a mosaic looking at China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, the challenge of climate change, the equally daunting challenge of the future of capitalism, the rise of populism. We've also looked at human rights, focusing on the still flickering embers of the Arab Spring. The story of Somaliland, which has managed to build a working democracy despite not even being recognized as a country internationally. The technology revolution and social media, whether as a force for democratic change on the streets of Africa or Asia, or equally a means of promoting narrow nationalism, supercharging conspiracy theories, and challenging the very existence of agreed facts. There is also a piece aimed at explaining how our changing world order looks from the perspective of Vladimir Putin's Russia. And just last week, an in-depth look at a key issue that I've been highlighting today, the retreat of America from many facets of its decades old engagement, influence and leadership in the world. Still, here is what the Monitor series also found, a range of voices and initiatives that seem to reflect a determination to imagine help create and defend a political landscape in which populism, narrow nationalism, and this transactional diplomacy do not ultimately define the future. Not necessarily a return to the old post-World War II order, but a new order that salvages, safeguards, and sustains the core values and principles on which it was built. Now, will that happen? None of us can say. But there is at least one reason to believe there may be some return to greater international engagement, cooperation, even compromise. It too has been reflected in the Monitor series, and it's been highlighted by the fragmented and often tragically ineffective world response to the coronavirus pandemic. It is this, many of the toughest challenges facing the early 21st century world, not just COVID-19 or the huge economic dislocation that it's leaving in its wake, but arms control, nuclear proliferation, immigration and refugees, climate change, of course, adapting to and managing the role of a rising China in the world, its relations not just with the US, but with Europe, Africa, Latin America, and of course, nearer Asian neighbors like Japan, South Korea, or Australia, and the continuing scourge of mass killings in conflict zones, or for instance, in Syria, the flouting of long accepted norms that at least barred the deliberate targeting of aid convoys, hospitals, and civilian shelter. None of these issues can be solved by any one nation on its own, nor by narrow transactional deals between a handful of states. And there's something else. As the so-called order institutions come under growing pressure, as the old order is creaking, it may be proven that weakening or leaving these institutions could carry costs of their own. Washington's currently stated view is that NATO, for instance, or the World Health Organization are somehow colossal ripoffs, a lot of American dollars, and at least if measured transactionally, very little in return. Yet an effective and strengthened WHO might actually have saved many thousands of lives including lives lost to COVID-19 in the United States. It's also worth remembering that American contributions to NATO have not just been charity. The Alliance was part of a policy and a strategy that aimed also to help safeguard America's own security. 
In my introductory piece to the Monitor series, which appeared way back in February, I included a couple of sentences which seemed to me even more relevant now, and perhaps the best way to conclude my remarks. We are in a period of turbulence and instability, I wrote, that is unprecedented during most of our lifetimes, but we are only at the beginning of defining what comes next. Thank you very much. Ned, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to listen uh, to what you had to say and your encouragement to engage with different worldviews and perspectives. I think that's um, something we all need to uh, do. Um, I can see from Ben already some questions that have come in. Um, I have a question in reserve, if needs be. I was really pleased to hear about your reference to the wise men. I read that book for my PhD many, many years ago and still have a copy somewhere. <laughs> um, but I will actually now move to the questions. Uh, we have um, roughly 30 minutes um, and I will take them in order. They might um, jump around the themes at first, um, but if you could use the, the hand up um, to, for me to see who wants to respond, that would be good. Because the first two questions at least are not directed at anyone specifically. Um, so the first question um, relates to tools, I would say. What about the idea of seeing foreign government top officials and leaders' assets and bank accounts in Western democracies to prevent their atrocities? Why is it that mi military intervention is the thing that comes first to mind in terms as a, a policy approach? Um, is Does anybody, okay, we'll start with Michael. I think there, this tactic, this tool, uh, has a lot to be said for it. The Magnitsky Act is deliberately a piece of legislation intended to do that in respect of those responsible for murder in in Russia. Um, but let's also be clear, it has to be done very prudently and carefully. Um, it's a very, you got to, you got to get your facts right. Um, and you can risk destabilizing the banking system of the um, entire world if you get this wrong. So you've got to balance two things. You want to get the right guys because occasionally shutting off uh, their bank accounts is a very good way of, of um, uh, tracking them down, uh, dissuading them as well. It has a dissuasive effect. But um, you want to be very, very careful about doing it because um, uh, we all have bank accounts and um, you don't want to destabilize the system that maintains those. So it is a it is a tool to use, but has to be done with discrimination. Thank you, John. Yes, I'm just wondering about you and possibly talking about other tools like shaming and naming and bodies like International Crisis Group providing international coverage and consciousness raising. Yeah, there are many tools that should be used and certainly military intervention should be the absolute last resort. And we can see how Frequently, it goes awry, particularly if a government uh, has mixed motives in engaging in uh, military intervention, as was the case in Iraq, for example, where clearly it was uh, national interests of the United States articulated by uh, that particular administration at the time. And it was anything but a humanitarian intervention and gave humanitarian intervention and R2P a bad name. So certainly these alternative tools are critical um and you know they start and they can be positive as well they don't have to be coercive necessarily they can certainly involve uh significant humanitarian aid assistance um, assistance in, in uh, working to build governments etc the problem is that in a failed state which is often where these atrocities are being uh committed uh, it's difficult to find a government uh, that you can actually, uh, you know, use to uh, develop a positive and, and non-coercive response. Uh, and then by the, on the other extreme, of course, you've got authoritarian governments uh, like Russia and other places where you don't even want to consider a, a military intervention. Uh, 
probably because of the prospects of, uh, of, of starting another war and a very dangerous one at that. So uh, you always want to look to these alternative uh, methods and naming and shaming is one of them. Certainly that's a kind of a fairly mild one, mm. uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, assistance to uh, governments and NGOs. Uh, arms embargoes are very important. And certainly uh, as Michael has just outlined, uh, carefully used, so can be uh, the target of uh, bank accounts and, and other uh, ways of getting at the leadership of a, of a group that's committing atrocities. Okay. Ned, now that you've had time to catch your breath since speaking, <laughs> would you like to chip in? Yeah. Uh, very briefly, just to come back to something Michael said in his uh, introductory remarks, w w which I think is important. And that is to understand the American political context. And John, you mentioned it as well, post-Iraq. And, and I think the challenge in these non-military interventions is to somehow, and it's a, it's a difficult argument to make, to separate the debate over uh, international military commitments in which we're in a kind of... Uh, parallel of the post-Vietnam trauma in American politics uh, w without having that tarnish the very idea of international engagement and cooperation for one very practical reason, that a lot of these non-military uh, actions or, or initiatives uh, are by definition, and, and none of them works perfectly, are by definition a lot more effective if you're not doing them alone. And, and a good example, even as we speak, is Hong Kong. Now, mm -hmm. whether there's anything that can be done to defend the, uh, you know, the 1997 agreement uh, practically or dissuade China from this new security legislation, who knows? But one thing I think we do know is that uh, whatever diplomatic, political, or economic response is likely to be less ineffective if it is part of a coalition action of some sort. All right. Michael wants to respond if you demute. <laughs> Just a very brief point. I think the point about Hong Kong is very well taken. Um, and you, you don't want to get in a shooting war with Hong Kong, with the Chinese, <laughs> that's for sure. But I, I do think, for example, the, the British offer of passports to Hong Kong, the, the Canadian offer of passports. I think that's very important. I think if if uh, China is faced with the possibility that literally, you know, a couple hundred thousand people just leave Hong Kong, Hong Kong collapses as a financial center. Um, these are non-military actions. They may have some intended consequences that have to be managed and thought through. But that's an example where I think you can you can use a diplomatic instrument that might have a very a positive effect because there are a tremendous number of Hong Kongers who have ties to Canada, have ties to Britain. And I think that's an actually an important lever. And needless to say, both China, both Canada and um, Britain are extremely alarmed about the consequences for them of using that instrument. But I think it's a pretty powerful um, uh, uh, it's, a, it, it's a very powerful statement uh, that if we can't stop the Chinese doing what they're doing, we can at least take them to a place where, they, where the rule of law applies and where they can be free. Okay, we might move to the second question, and it's a theme that John actually picked up in terms of uh, uh, international assistance, um, and it's a question that drives to sort of hidden interests in giving um, international aid. So the question is, if states are unwilling to intervene and reject values-based foreign policy, where does this leave humanitarian international aid? And the questioner notes that international aid also creates new markets and therefore benefits uh, the giver, the uh, donor state interest. So is this a transactionalism that's a little bit under the carpet? Anybody wish to respond to this particular? Okay, John. Got to unmute, John. <laughs> 
mute. How is that? Okay. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the present situation of uh, humanitarian international aid. Uh, I'm more optimistic because I believe that there are some significant changes that are likely to occur in the near term uh, in the political sphere, hopefully particularly in the United States, about the long-term future of international humanitarian aid. But in a world of nationalist uh, governments, um, uh, transactionalism, uh, as we have said throughout this, uh, is the governing principle. And I think uh, probably China is, is the best example in a way. They have, they have certainly expanded their uh, international assistance, but it's almost entire, it's not only transactional, it's actually contractual. Uh, once you extend the assistance, uh, China uh, expects, uh, once they extend it, they expect something uh, significant in return. And given their economic leverage, they're almost certainly able to get it. So it's a very, it's a very dangerous moment. Uh, the United States, of course, has significantly reduced its uh, humanitarian international assistance. Uh, USAID has been scaled back uh, greatly in the current era. Um, illustrating my main point. So, but I do, but I do think it's a, it's a very important instrument. And yes, it does have uh, uh, some uh, beneficial aspects for the giver. Uh, the longer term beneficial aspects are that you can stabilize more effectively uh, a whole region or a, certainly a country if you do uh, more international assistance. Okay, in that case, uh, I'll move to question three, an interesting one. How can we break up uh, the club of transactionalists? We're not just talking about one state, but many states that shore themselves, each of them up by their approach. I can see Michael already wants to respond. So the question is talking about ch uh, China, Turkey, Venezuela, Russia, Poland, Philippines, Hungary, and others that are almost like a club giving each other mutual support and sharing tactics. So, Michael. Um, I mean, one comment before I reply, I, I think it honesty requires us to say that the foreign policy of great states has always been transactional. I mean, let's not, let's not leave people thinking we went from a period of kind of let's do something for someone else to an area where we only do stuff for ourselves. It's just not the case. I think what, what is new is the exclusively transactional character of so much. Um, uh, many people, I'm a greatest possible fan of the United States, but a lot of people would be astounded to be told that American foreign policy was disinterested and concerned with the salvation of mankind. I mean, it just wouldn't quite work with for a lot of people possibly listening to the program. On to the question, though, if I, if I may, um, the only piece of that I can pick up is Hungary, because I'm in Hungary and care about it a lot. And John Shattuck has written very well about it as well. Um, I, I think that there, there, there are two great things that matter here. One of them is liberal democracies have to get their own house in order. There's a kind of cultivate our own garden aspect of this. It's a terribly important. Um, authoritarian regimes, China, Turkey, Venezuela, Russia, uh, the Philippines, uh, are riding on a story about liberal democracy, which is that we're not very good at anything. We're a bunch of hypocrites, we're soft, we don't stand up for anything. Our systems don't really work. Uh, China is going to um, uh, surpass us in terms of um, GDP and even net personal income. So the challenge is for liberal democracy is very simple, which is to be, be successful, uh, to live up to the promise, um, to um, do something. There's some later questions about the the devastating impact of inequality on our capacity to maintain social solidarity and cohesion. So the first thing is just get our own story together. I mean, Hungary, Orban sits there year after year after year, denouncing the kind of uh, 
uh, fact that multiculturalism in Western Europe doesn't work and that every time you have any immigrants in your society, it always breaks down and causes crime and chaos. And in fact, the reality of, you know, um, the uh, multiculturalism in Britain and in Germany and in France has been in many ways massively successful. There are enormous problems with it. I don't want to push anything under the carpet, but unless liberal democracy gets up and says, yes, we have taken, you know, up to 16, 17% of our population from foreign countries. We have Islam in our house and it has been good for our country. We have people from every part of the world in our house and it's been good for us. I mean, stand up for that stuff. Otherwise, people like Orban get a pass and he goes into his domestic audience and says, see, look at, look at, Look at Germany, look at France, look at Britain, it's all falling apart. So we have to defend what we have done here, which is to keep, to create a liberal democracy based on mass inclusion of populations who 60, 70 years ago were not part of our societies. And that, it seems to be very important. Second point, I'm sorry to go on so long and then I'll stop, is you've got to just stand up to Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban gets four to five billion euros a year of structural funds from the European Union. And he cashes the check on Saturday and from Monday through Friday runs against the EU. Now you can't go on like this. You have to say, shut up and live by the values or we're gonna turn off your water. You, you know, I mean, this isn't rocket science here. Uh, the, the EU simply has to say, this is not simply as someone said recently, a cash machine. This is a community of values. You're not living up to it. Therefore, um, your future in this operation is conditional on your compliance with the basic minimum of democratic freedom. I mean, so that's the kind of stuff we need to do. Sorry to go on so long. I didn't mean to take away from other people right. wanting to. That's perfectly fine. And I'm going to ask uh, Ned and John to uh, respond as well. But I think it's so important here to bring in question five, uh, because it's very much linked to question three and, and the way in which Michael was talking about individual political leaders. Um, so question five is what, what impact might a change in US leadership have or is transactionalism too widely spread by now? So we'll go to, to Ned. I, yeah, I think that's a great question. And the short answer is we don't know. We don't even know for sure whether this is a one-term president. Uh, here's what we do know, that, uh, that Joe Biden and many of the people around him, unlike many in the current regime, at least can find most countries on the map. Uh, they come from a political and historical context that uh, believes in multilateralism that has seen uh, not just the, the frustrations, but the advantages of international alliances uh, and American uh, capacity to act within them all over the world. And if I can just riff a bit on Michael's point, I couldn't agree more that uh, American foreign policy has never been sort of just Mother Teresa, feel it, you know, uh, it, it, it just set, sitting around a campfire and singing Kumbaya. So, so I, that certainly wouldn't be what I would suggest. But here's the crucial argument I would make. Um, one of the reasons I went back to the wise men and that generation and post-war is there was a sense that um, that standing up for these values, things like international engagement, international aid, um, were good for the United States. That 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 not every gain for the United States could be monetized, and not every instance in which someone else got something meant the United States was at a disadvantage. And I think that's a crucial distinction. And I think that's one thing we have to hope is rediscovered. And I think under a Biden regime, it almost certainly would be. Now, what, what specifically that would mean uh, is, is much more difficult to say. 
Yeah, I think the most important point uh, from my uh, perspective uh, to recognize about the United States today politically on the eve of the 2020 presidential election is the the power of diversity and uh, multiculturalism, as Michael was saying, this is a moment where um, I, this is driving the forces of change. Uh, the U.S. Uh, mobilization, if you will, of its very diverse population, uh, particularly people who have been affected uh, negatively over many years by uh, systemic racism and the inequalities that have emerged uh, partly as a result of some of the economic uh, developments in recent years and partly uh, even going more deeply than that. So the U.S. is, is on the verge of, of demonstrating the power of its multicultural uh, body politic. And that, that I think, uh, underneath it all, uh, will lead to a change uh, if there is indeed a change of presidential leadership and a new administration and Biden becomes the president, uh, it, it will certainly lead to a change in the perspective of how the U.S. relates uh, to the larger world, which itself is obviously very diverse. And I've always thought that one of the great strengths of American democracy, which has been severely uh, weakened uh, recently, um, is indeed the fact that uh, it is such a racially diverse and ethnically diverse society as a nation of immigrants, all of the various catchphrases that you've heard. But in fact, many of them are true. And uh, what we've had is a reaction against that. Uh, but I think the reaction is failing, at least it's failing in terms of the uh, ability to deliver uh, the kinds of uh, of government and the kind the kind of uh, services that people demand. So, uh, what is this all? How does this all translate in foreign policy terms? Somewhat indirectly, uh, I think to to get a sense of the Biden foreign policy, you probably have to look uh, back to the Obama foreign policy, uh, and I think Obama was. Um, was pulling back from some of the more uh, aggressive internationalist perspectives, but it was a very multilateral uh, working with other countries uh, approach. And, and I think that's what you'll see in a Biden, in a Biden regime. But above all, it'll be a, a regime driven by the uh, power of American political diversity, pol ethnic, racial, uh, and, and therefore also political diversity. Thank you, John, uh, that we still have um, some questions and fast running out of time. Um, and again, I'm jumping around the questions. Question number eight, um, does naming and shaming work anymore when the leaders have no shame? And I think the real guts of the question here is uh, Duterte says that he's proud to go against international humanitarian law. Orban is in favor of what he calls illiberal democracy. Are other states now offering viable or attractive alternatives to um, the kind of vision that the United States and other liberal democracies uh, promoted uh, previously? You know, is democracy of that type, and there are many types of democracy, is democracy of that type uh, in its older age? Old age. Michael. I think this, the naming and shaming idea, I think, presupposed a certain kind of internationalism, uh, a I mean, a universalism of moral judgment and valuation that I think is under tremendous pressure. Um, that is to say, you're only shamed if you feel a sense of moral obligation to the person who is shaming you. And if you feel none as Duterte, that's why it's a very good question, feels none about killing um, supposed drug offenders, then it's very unclear how any external pressure uh, is going to change him. But I, I think that then makes us rethink the relationship between external pressure and internal pressure. Duterte will stay in ruling the Philippines until the people of the Philippines throw him out. The people, Orban will stay in Hungary until the people of 
Hungary throw him out. Nothing that external actors can do can change that in my view. What external actors can do is to encourage internal actors, not by funding, not by, but just by the presence of we approve of what you're trying to do. Um, I think that's how that it works. But I think internal change is the only legitimate change. I don't think we you know, get rid of, Duterte could care less what the ICC thinks or what, but external disapproval, the United States saying, we just, this is terrible stuff, Mr. Duterte, you gotta stop that. That encourages domestic drivers that may in time have an effect but the old days in which somehow we had some fantasy that external disapproval by authoritative human rights bodies or even an indictment by an international court would be sufficient to change internal outcomes. I think that is, it was a fantasy at the time and I think it's long past now. We have to put our faith basically in internal domestic processes and those take whatever time they take. Ned? Yeah, just very briefly, and this is going to sound, um, um, as I think I said in my comments, I, I risk sounding uh, naive or, uh, or, or uh, which, I, which I don't think I am. I've been a foreign correspondent for most of my life, including in places where people were shooting each other, killing each other, uh, suppressing democracy. But, but uh, quaint though this is, um, I want to piggyback on something Michael said in, in terms of how one uh, gives hope to democratic processes. And I would mention two points very briefly. Um, one, um, we have to realize, we have to get, get back in touch with a notion that far from something you apologize for as being kind of soft. Uh, these values matter. And one of the strengths internationally, one of the reasons the American century, not the only one, but one of the reasons the American century existed was because uh, uh, America was more than just a transactional power. It was absolutely a transactional power. Uh, but it was not a country like any other in that context. And, and the basic strength that that side of the argument has is because in all my experience, at least, uh, and many of the places I've covered are dictatorships and some of them quite brutal, I have yet to meet an individual human being who would rather be brutalized and live under a dictator than be free and not live under a dictator. And, and I, I conclude with one of my favorite experiences as a young kind of teen foreign correspondent in my first war assignment, which was the Lebanese Civil War in Beirut. And one of the things I covered as a wire service correspondent was the Palestinian leadership. And I, for the first time, was interviewing Yasser Arafat, who was headquartered in Beirut. And one of his aides was uh, of English speaking, quite smooth, East German educated um, Palestinian who sat me down before I went in and said, um, you need to hear the world as it really is. And gave me, duly lectured me about American imperialism the devil's deal between American imperialism and Zionism. And I just said, yes, 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 as one does. And then a couple of weeks later, as I recall, uh, I was in there interviewing him or someone else. And he pulled me aside afterwards and asked whether I knew how to get a green card. And, <laughs> and I thought it was an irony worth taking away with me. Okay, uh, 
Thank you. Uh, can I come to you in a moment, John, on that point? Because I want to get to this one last question, uh, which follows on from the green card. Um, and the American century, also one of its great achievements has been to provide economic progress and jobs and trade and development assistance. Um, and uh, question six goes to this issue of inequality. Um, how relevant is inequality of the type that Ned talked about within society to the rise of transactionalism and uh, what is probably going to be a rise of precarity for many groups and communities and uh, nations over the next uh, couple of years due to the impact of the pandemic. So, um, John, do you want to perhaps start? And just keeping in mind, this is the last question. Sure. Well, I will start where I would have started even uh, before this question, but it's quite appropriate. Um, I think the, from my perspective is, and I think others have said this on the panel, I believe Michael said it, is that uh, the United States and other uh, transatlantic democracies have to get their house in order. Uh, and the United States in particular, if we believe in these principles of democracy, human rights, um, equal opportunity, uh, we have to take major steps at home to address them. And that will indeed improve significantly the, and, and open up uh, channels for a different kind of uh, foreign policy. Maybe not non-transactional, because I certainly agree with Michael that all foreign policy is by definition somewhat transactional, but foreign policy based on values rather than simply based on a kind of national, either national self-interest uh, or even the interest of the political interest of the leader in question. Um, and for that reason, uh, I think particularly the issue of inequality uh, needs to be addressed as part of getting the House in order in the United States. And I think uh, here again, if there's a change in leadership, I believe there will be some significant uh, reforms that, that, are, that are going to be possible, uh, again, if there's a change in leadership in the Congress as well, uh, which uh, could address uh, issues of, of inequality. Um, I'll put in a shameless plug for a big project that I'm uh, now leading, which uh, will come to a head in another month or so. And it's, it's a project uh, at the Kennedy School of Government called Renewing Rights and Responsibilities in the United States. And it's a, a survey of all of the ways in which uh, human rights standards have slipped uh, significantly and even and been undermined uh, in the United States and a set of recommendations about what can be done uh, in uh, many different areas. And the area of equality is of course, uh, under US constitutional law issues of equal protection and equal opportunity and expanding opportunity for uh, those in our society who have been shut out and many have, and certainly the pandemic has shown this and the current economic crisis has shown it. So uh, we are going to uh, come forward with a set of recommendations about how to renew rights and responsibilities in the United States. Obviously it will take a new government in order to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Michael, a quick um, comment if you like, before we end with Ned. No, I just want to want to make sure I read uh, John's report. Um, one one additional sentence. Um, I do think that uh, rekindling American a, a values based foreign policy means taking American foreign policy and American commitments back to the country. There's been an uncoupling of American foreign policy from its domestic base of political support. And unless that's renewed, uh, you can't get the democratic support for a outward faced foreign policy that I think the United States uniquely created between about 1943 under Roosevelt, right through um, possibly until uh, the turn of the century. So. And that's a phenomenon of an inequality, the sense that this foreign policy is not my foreign policy, it's, it's some elite in Washington. Getting that fixed is a huge job, but um, you know, 
America's an amazing place, so why not? I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. And Ned, uh, the wise men and women of foreign <laughs> policy, too elite and too distant as experts from everyday people. Uh, it's, it's an argument that, that, that I've heard. Uh, I'm going to be very brief and say two things. First of all, it's been a real pleasure to be part of this panel and to participate in your conference. Um, and second of all, to, to end not on a completely optimistic note, but on a note which I hope emphasizes the, important of the importance of the moment we're in. And John has alluded to the upcoming election and the specific political challenges challenges of values that the United States in particular faces. I think in a weird way, the terrible arrival of COVID-19 and in a way, the colossal screw up in dealing with it on an international level, some of it willful, has the potential to be something of a wake up call because in a way that no one would have wished it shows the difference between going it alone and going it in consultation, ideally in partnership with others who are facing exactly the same challenge that you do. And my hope, I guess, is that that allows the kind of space, the intellectual and political space to do exactly what Michael rightly suggests is necessary. And that is to rekindle a conversation in domestic politics about why all of this matters, why it's not just spending money, aid, mm -hmm. what country do you invade, why do you invade them, should, should there be military action? Uh, it's a much more profound debate uh, that requires a kind of reconnection between domestic and international politics. Okay, John, uh, Ned and John and Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. The conversation does continue tomorrow. We're out of time uh, now, but tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. The next session is how transactional foreign policy impacts prevention of and accountability for atrocities. And then the last session at 4 p.m., um, continuing, as I said, the conversation. So everybody who's been joined online, thanks for coming along. And I hope you continue um, with us tomorrow. Thank you.